So welcome. Uh, this is uh, 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 the course on foundations of modern social thought. Uh, it has a sociology number, a political science number, and a humanities number. Um, and my name is Ivan Seleni. I'm a professor of sociology and professor of political science. And it is my honor that I can introduce you uh, to uh, some of the founding uh, uh, fathers. I'm afraid they are all fathers. Right? Uh, no mothers among them. I will tell you why not. <laughs> uh, of uh, modern social thought. Uh, it's basically um, theories uh, uh, starting uh, uh, from the 16th century and ending up with the early 20th century. This course is very interdisciplinary. It's not accidental. It has a humanities number, a political science number, and a sociology number. Um, in fact, as we start discussing uh, the foundations of modern science in the 16th century, there is even no distinction, no sharp distinction between sciences and social sciences. Right? The first author on our list, Thomas Hobbes, did a lot of work on optics um, and has been in a violent controversy with Descartes. So those of you who are in natural sciences are probably familiar with Descartes and his pioneering work on optics. Um, John Locke, for those of you who aspire to become a doctor, was actually studying medicine and performed a surgery uh, on a very well-known uh, uh, English uh, uh, politician. Uh, quite a successful surgery, though even today doctors quite don't know whether uh, these politicians survived because of good luck or because of the surgery. Uh, anyway, the point I'm trying to make uh, uh, in the early, you know, uh, uh, 16, 17, 18 centuries, um, uh, sciences uh, and social sciences are not separated from each other yet. Jean Jacques Rousseau, uh, a real pain in the neck, but an extremely smart guy. Um, he also wrote an important book uh, which dealt with sciences and social studies. Um, it's really by the kind of uh, late 18th century uh, that people beginning to identify as studying society or human behavior. But even then, until the very last author, what we have here, Emil Durkheim, People identify themselves with a number of approaches, disciplinary approaches. They were social scientists all right, or philosophers all right. The difference between philosophy and, and, and social science is a very vague one. So, uh, um, uh, um, they beginning to distinguish themselves uh, uh, um, uh, increasingly uh, 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 from sciences, but they are still multidisciplinary. Uh, who is Karl Marx? You know, he is a philosopher, he is an economist, uh, he is a political scientist. Uh, sociologists name him as one of the founding fathers of sociology. Max Weber, uh, he identified himself as a as a, a legal theorist, right? Um, he was studying uh, uh, economic history. He, he, I think primarily he identified himself early in life as, a, as an economist, as an economic historian. Um, later in life he began to call himself a sociologist. So the point is, this is a very interdisciplinary course, uh, so one advantage is of you to take this course uh, is uh, that you will be getting uh, knowledge which leads you, which would benefit you uh, if you are studying sciences, if you are 
uh, if you want to become a psychologist, if you become an economist or a political scientist or an anthropologist or a philosopher, I mean, this list of names, right, will appear on your reading list. Okay, so that's, I think, uh, I will go, I have many, many slides to show you and I will try to bring them alive to you a little. Um, uh, so I don't want to waste too much of my time uh, to, to, to rush through all this. But let me still speak to some of the uh, details, but I'm sure many of you are particularly interested. First, about the readings. Uh, and my first advice is, don't let yourself to be scared by me, right? All the readings are on the Internet. You don't have to buy any books. You don't have to go to the library. You just go to the Internet and you unload the readings and you can print the readings out. That's when you get scared because some of the readings are too long and some of the readings you start reading and you feel you don't understand the word of it. Well, your experience is not very different from mine when I was reading this text for the first time. So, my advice is don't get scared, right? I don't expect you to do much more reading for this course uh, in a week than, let's say, five or six hours. This will not be enough for you, right? In first reading, to get the readings on your command. I mean, reading characters like Hobbes, or reading even characters like Nietzsche, is a hard stuff to do. My advice is that you kind of click read, skim read for the lecture. Do some reading for the lecture, so you can come in with a sense of the text. <coughs> then I will give you uh, the most important citations and an interpretation, and then I give you a searchlight. You can go back to the text and you know what you are looking for, right? And get ready for the discussion section. At the discussion section, I will keep my mouth shut and I want you to talk. I will ask questions and we will have a lively discussion, right? Um, so by that time, you will have to have more of a sense. But I will use a lot of PowerPoints Right? And the PowerPoints will be put on the internet and will help you to go through the text. So my first point is, don't get scared with the readings. Please don't drop this course because you said there are too many, too difficult readings. This is not meant to be an easy course. But I will make it easy for you. Okay? <laughs> easy and fun. You know? You can't believe how Thomas Hobbes can be fun, but give me just one week, right? And you will see how fun he is, all right? Now, the other concern, right, people who shop, assignments. Well, there are quite a few assignments to this course, but I am one of those people who are scared of exams. I was almost 70 when I got my driver's license because I did not want to fake, uh, fail, you know, my driver's test. So I understand anxieties about tests. So therefore, uh, I have been working hard over my life to make assignments serious, make sure that you put serious work into the course, you master the material, and at the same time, the level of anxiety is reduced near zero. How do I do that? Easy. There will be three tests. All the three tests will be administered on the Internet. You sit in your room, you sit in a library, you go to a coffee shop, you go to Starbucks, and you log in 8 p.m., on a given day, and then you will get questions from which you have to answer some of them, right? I also will give you a set of questions one week before the test, so you will not be surprised 
what kind of questions you will be asked. I will reduce that list, and even from this, let's say, I will give you a list of about eight to ten questions, reduce it to three, and then you will have to answer two, okay? But there will be no anxiety, you will know exactly what's going on, you will have one hour uh, to answer it, I don't mind, you know, if you prepare and you cut and paste and you put it on the internet, that's okay. Uh, it's an open book, you can use books. What I want you to do, not to use books, I want to use your brain right, for a change. Okay, so that's the, the three tests. And then there will be one paper for the end of the course. And uh, the paper is not a big deal, uh, I just want to have to try to bring the course together, different elements of the course to, together. The three tests are about three blocks of the courses. The paper is supposed to link at least two blocks of these courses, right? Uh, um, and again, you will be able to talk to me and your teaching fellows about the paper topic. Um, and let me then introduce uh, us, uh, our teaching assistants, uh, teaching fellows, uh, to introduce themselves. Would you do so? I'm Elizabeth Freak, and I'm a third year student in the sociology department. I'm Jeff Platt, also a third year in the Well, we, we have a third one who didn't show. Uh, and I will take also two discussion sections uh, uh, myself. Uh, uh, I will take uh, Monday and Wednesday a discussion section, um, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, so sort of make sure that people uh, uh, don't, don't, don't overlap with other obligations. Even athletes can take it because practices are usually over and dinner is over, right? So after dinner, you can ha come to a nice after-dinner conversation with me. And I will be grading the assignments of, of students uh, who take my discussion sections. Um, you can also be sure uh, that we will make all efforts that everybody will be able to get into a discussion section. So right now the crowd is bigger than the number of teaching fellows and myself we have so far on the internet listed only five discussion sections. But uh, 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 if you want to take the course and you do not fit into any of the discussion sections, you will be talking to me and I will be figuring out that you will get your discussion section. Not a single person should drop out of this course because there is no discussion section that students will take. You have my word for it, okay? Um, I think that's probably all um, uh, housekeeping. Any question about this? If yes, please, loud. Well, it looks like it's clear, right? Hope clear and, and attractive. Uh, as just one very last... Uh, sentence, I don't want this to be a Mickey Mouse course, I want to be, this to be serious, right? I want you to be challenged, I want to you to think, I want to, to, to you to read, and I want to remember what you learned in, in this course, right? But I want to level, decrease the level of anxiety and make the workload reasonable. And if you come to lectures, you come to discussion sections, right? it will be okay, right? You will not be overloaded by work and you will not be full with anxiety. Now, let me try to rush quickly through of all of these authors and give you at least a couple of words about everyone so you get a sense what will happen in this course, all right? And I have how many? 27 minutes to do that. Uh, so this is Thomas Hobbes born in 1588. Uh, well, uh, Hobbes uh, uh, had a, a, a bit of a troubled childhood, uh, a difficult father who was a clergyman, got into a fight with another clergyman, 
and had to disappear. He had a fight actually in a cemetery, which in the 16th century was no, no, especially for clergymen. Anyway, he uh, grew up uh, with uh, uncles. Nevertheless, he got to the University of Oxford, did pretty good, and became a tutor um, of William Cavendish. Um, and then traveled with him to Europe, um, or France and Italy, and he met Galileo and was greatly influenced by Galileo. At that time, um, in English universities, they were mainly teaching Aristotle. Um, and, uh, well, Hobbes became very disenchanted with Aristotle, the dogmatism of Aristotle's philosophy, and he was thrilled by the emergence of new positive science. Uh, what Galileo represented. Um, then he can, came back in England and there were very turbulent politics. I will talk about this greater in the course. And he was among those, he's a conservative guy. If you are Republican, you will love it. Uh, he sided with uh, the king against the parliament. And since he did that, uh, he, 19, uh, 1640, he better escaped and went to France into exile and then returned in 51 uh, to England um, because he was a troublemaker. He was not only in conflict with the Republicans, he was also in conflict with the Royalists. Uh, he died in uh, 1679. Now, uh, uh, his first work was a translation of Thucydides. He liked Thucydides because he thought Thucydides showed why democracy doesn't work, right? He's an absolutist, uh, Hobbes, a conservative, <coughs> right, absolutist. Um, and then he wrote an interesting trilogy, and this is again shows the unity of sciences and social sciences. The, tri the first volume deals with the human body, with biology, the second uh, works with, on the individual, it is really psychology, and the last one works on society and politics. And he thinks the way how to understand uh, human existence is start with bodily functions and move from bodily functions to uh, uh, politics and philosophy. And then his major work is Leviathan. This is the work probably most of you heard the title of, um, and this was actually at, at a time when Charles I um, was already executed um, and uh, 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 he actually was considering there should, should be a possibility to transfer loyalty to a new ruler, but the royalist, fellow royalist or in exile in Paris didn't like, so now he had to escape Paris to escape the anger of the royalists. Uh, this is the first uh, edition of the Leviathan, one of the most influential books uh, in politics ever written. Well, um, not a very attractive book. Uh, the main theme is uh, that in the state of nature, naturally by human nature, uh, people are quite evil. Uh, and, therefore, order has to be imposed over people above each other, otherwise there would be a war, uh, we, we would be in a state of war of everyone against everyone. This is the major citation from Leviathan, that's what everybody knows, right? Okay, John Locke is the next, uh, born uh, uh, half a century later, also a British uh, uh, scientist. Um, uh, uh, he came from a, a minor gentry family. Uh, he also studied in Oxford, philosophy, and as I said, medicine was also uh, his second major. Um, early on, he was very much attracted to Hobbes, um, but then he met a major uh, a British politician, Shaftesbury. He, con he performed the uh, uh, liver operation uh, on him, assumedly saving his life, and then he changed course 
uh, from a conservatives uh, and became a sort of a Republican uh, or by American political standards. He shifted from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. That's what he did. Right? Um, well, in fact, he was even involved in 82 in a plot to overthrow absolutism and he had to escape to the Netherlands, returned in 89 to London and died a few years later. Um, well, uh, his conservative work was in 64, uh, his address at the college in which actually offered the Hobbesian thesis, things are gods and the people are beasts. But then he changed completely. Uh, he already writes an important paper on toleration. Uh, liberals are still reading it. Um, and especially he writes the two treaties, which is a, a major foundation work for modern democratic theory, major foundation work for the American Constitution as well. This is the first edition of it. So what are the main points? Uh, he said, well, men are born free and equal, uh, in, and in the state of nature they are good. There is a need for superior, but the superior can also be uh, accepted by the consent of everybody who is subjected to authority. Um, and he is the first um, a, a political theorist who advocates the separation of powers and has a major impact, together with Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, on the foundation of the American Constitution. This is where the American Constitution comes from. Now we move from, uh, from uh, England to France, uh, to Montesquieu, who was uh, born at the late uh, 17th century and lived in the kind of already swinging 18th century. 18th century was a century, at least in France, fun to live in. Uh, well, it was a lot of turbulence, uh, but interpersonal relationships were quite interesting, I would say. It reminds me of the 1960s, you know, <laughs> hobbies and, uh, you know, of hippies and whatever, right? Uh, sort of before the French Revolution, you had the 1960s kind of stuff. Well, there was not marijuana, but there was a lot of various kind of sex, right? Uh, which made, uh, made the 18th century quite fun, and the life of Montesquieu made it quite fun. Well, he was uh, born in the right place, near Bordeaux, where the good wine is grown, a bread. Uh, his name was actually Charles Louis de Seconda, and he became Montesquieu when his uncle died and inherited the title of uh, Baron de Montesquieu from him. He studied uh, uh, law. Uh, he's a major legal theorist. Any one of you who is heading to law school will have to take this course because the theory of law, right, starts with Montesquieu, right? Anyway, he studied uh, at the University of Bordeaux. In '28, he did the right thing, you know, to be in a parliamentarian in Bordeaux was boring. And whether he did, he went into commerce. He became a wine merchant and a mercenary and an adventurer. Spent two years traveling all over in Europe and having a lots of fun, leaving his wife behind to run the business. Not very nice of him. So the money, uh, wife was sending the money, right, to uh, 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 money orders or the equivalents of it. Uh, wherever he was having fun, you know, in, in Italy or England or the Netherlands, where there was fun. Uh, then when he returned, he began to do writing, particularly uh, his major book uh, we will talk about, and he died. Um, in 55, about the work, there are two major works, the Persian Letters, which is a fun work, an ironic view of French and Persian um, uh, 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 
uh, if of, of, of the life of Paris uh, in, 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 the, in the eyes of two uh, Persian visitors, a kind of ironic view uh, of the absurdities of, of French, uh, French life. And then, 48, he writes finally his major book, The Spirits of Laws, um, uh, which, uh, um, you know, it's an extremely important book, and you will read, this is the first edition of it, you will read from it. What are the major contributions? Well, as I mentioned already, Locke needed, uh, uh, noticed the need for the separation of powers. Uh, but Locke separated only three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and once what he called the uh, 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 federative. Uh, Montesquieu formulated the way how it is in the American Constitution, right? Namely, he separates the legislative, the executive, and the judicial branch. And we will talk a great deal about this, why it is so important to separate uh, the juridical branch from the legislative and the executive. And then, uh, he also did something very pioneering, extremely naive day, but very pioneering. He looked at ecosystem, right? He is a sort of the first environmentalist, not quite. Even Khaldun did much before him. But for uh, a modern, more contemporary theorist, it's really Montesquieu, who tries to explain the nature of laws with uh, climatic conditions, looks at the interaction between nature and society, and it took us basically 300 years to realize how important this interaction is, right? So he's really doing some absolutely path-breaking work. Um, now, this is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I mean that I have many favorites among these people. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is one of them. Not because I disagree with everything what he said, but he says it so provocatively, and it, it is in such a fun way that I just cannot uh, uh, resist to enjoy it uh, all the time. He was born already in the 18th century and died just before the French Revolution, though played a big role uh, paving the road to the French Revolution. About his life, he was born in Geneva, so he's Swiss, uh, whatever it means. Uh, his father was a watchmaker, uh, and uh, like Hobbes, um, had a turbulent childhood. Uh, the father probably had some debt, so he had to jump the boat and went to Istanbul and left his son behind, um, uh, uh, who then, uh, in 28, uh, moved to Annecy, uh, 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 France, and met uh, a wonderful lady, uh, Mrs. Warren, who took in uh, young boys, uh, uh, right? Um, uh, he was uh, just about 16 at that time. Um, uh, she was about 10 or 12 years uh, his senior, and well, I will talk about this more. I will give you all this gossip uh, in, 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 in this course. Um, uh, well, it fascinated a lot of people. Um, uh, later on, this interesting relationship between Jean-Jacques and Mrs. Warren. Standard. Uh, uh, um, anybody remembers the name of the French novelist? Uh, um, uh, Rouge et Noir, uh, 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 Red and Black. Well, this is all telling the story of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Mrs. Warren. <coughs> well, uh, um, the affair lasted for a long time. Uh, then he moved in 42 in Paris, and he became a superstar. You know, wherever he was, he had to be a superstar. And he was a superstar in everything. Uh, it's a, I, I, there is just no match. Uh, um, probably Leonardo da Vinci, as somebody who, who can be compared with Rousseau in his as a Renaissance man. You know, he, he knew everything, and he did everything perfectly. Perfectly. I mean, 
all problematic. Well, in 62, he publishes two of his major books, and I will talk about them in a little later. The big scandals, they have to escape France because he would be in big trouble with the church in particular, but in Switzerland he doesn't get along very well either, so then he goes to England, returns later to France um, under an assumed name and died in 78. Okay, uh, about Rousseau's work, I skip uh, uh, the first one which I said is still dealing with sciences and social sciences. Uh, the disciplines are not separated from each other. But let me also mention that in 52, he writes an opera. And he writes a wonderful opera, Le Davin du Village. I have a CD of the opera, and if I would know how to play music, um, I would show you some of his uh, music. It's great music. Um, Mozart was so excited uh, that he actually wrote an opera following Rousseau's opera. He was in a big, I will talk about this later, I'm a bit uh, uh, um, uh, obsessed with, with, with music. Uh, um, anyway, he was in a big conflict with the greatest French composer ever, Rameau. I'm sure many of you know um, the work of Rameau, a great 18th century uh, musician. Well, Rousseau was not quite as great as composer as Rameau, but uh, uh, um, uh, had a debate with him, and his music was to be an alternative to Rameau. Rameau wanted to write French music, and uh, Rousseau was committed to Italian music. Melody, bel canto, right? That's what he loved. And that's what Mozart, in most of his operas, loved. That's why Mozart loved Rousseau, rather than Rameau, right? Okay. And um, then, second book, Discourse of Origins of Inequality, absolutely great book. I don't have the, the time to work on this. And then in 62, the two big books we will, you will be reading from Emil and Social Contracts. Emil, uh, 72, uh, some of the major themes. Uh, I mean, he writes about educational philosophy. Those of you who are heading to education, this book is a must, right? You cannot be, right, uh, uh, an educationalist without having read Emil cover to cover, right? This is the foundations of modern educational theory. Um, and he follows the life uh, of a young adult. And the main point is society corrupts, puts all the bad ideas in people's mind. So the real reason of education is to get rid of education what people got. Well, I don't have, I can't quite have the ambitions to do it in this course now, to get everything what you learned so far out of your mind and to get the new ideas, but that's what Rousseau thought real education is. Education is negative education. Uh, probably wrong, but very provocative idea, right? And then, um, uh, he is the opposite of Hobbes. Nature is, many nature is good, uh, uh, and foreshadows Marx who also believed that. Now the social contract, well, the idea is that legitimate authority has to be authorized by those subjected to authority, um, and uh, he advocated the first popular sovereignty, right? It has to be done by the uh, majority of men. He actually was not advocating uh, voting rights for women yet, but at least voting rights for all <coughs> men. <coughs> uh, but he also uh, suggested that individuals know only their own interests. There must be a state which expresses the general will. We will talk about this a great deal later on. Adam Smith is the next one. Again, you want to be an econ economist? You have to read the wealth of nation cover to cover more than once, right? Otherwise, you are not an eco e economist. So we will be dealing with Adam Smith. Uh, was born in 1723, uh, studied at the University of Glasgow and later in Oxford. 
um, became a professor of uh, logic and professor of moral philosophy. Extremely interesting that uh, the most utilitarian economist was a philo professor of moral philosophy. And in fact, his first book is called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. It is about all about ethics rather than rational calculation. Um, um, and then he travels in France, matters all kinds of people, returns to Glasgow, and finally, 76, writes the book, what those of you who are heading into business will have to read, The Wealth of Nations. And he <coughs> died in 96. That is two Adam Smiths, one who is uh, talking about the self-interested individuals, who always act rationally, and uh, the, the individuals acting, pursuing self-interest, um, uh, fulfill social interest. This is in the, uh, about in the theory of moral sentiment. He is writing about sympathy. He's writing about the helping hand. He's writing about God rather than just business and self-interest. And there has been a library of literature, whether there are two uh, Adam Smiths or whether they complement each other. And that is really one theory, uh, and one good economic theory, which is both ethical and rational and calculative. Okay. And this is the wealth of nation. Um, uh, well, one big issue is what he promotes, self-interest, right? People should be acting out of self-interest in order to achieve the common good. And people are the best judge of their interest, not the government, right? Well, this is very much a question for today. Um, Health care reform. Does it, do, do, do we need the government to tell us what kind of health care reform we need? Adam Smith probably would say, no, you don't need the government. You should judge for yourself what kind of health care you want. And then he develops the labor theory of value, uh, that all value is uh, created by labor. He develops in an interesting way, but foreshadows uh, uh, Karl Marx later on. And then, uh, of course, he's known about the idea of the invisible hand. Well, the invisible hand is not that obvious. He uses the term three times in his work, and each time he's using in a different sense. One, it means simply... Uh, <coughs> uh, the invisible hand is the free, unregulated market. That's how we normally understand it today. Then he is using it as the hand of God. And then he is actually using it as the hand of Jupiter, right? As the bad hand, as the fate. So, um, we will discuss this a great deal. It's, it's real fun. Uh, okay, then John Stuart Mill. And in fact, uh, uh, Harriet Taylor, uh, who is a companion later wife, very important for his work. Well, he was born in London uh, um, and was actually brought up uh, by Jeremy Bentham. Um, uh, Jeremy Bentham uh, um, uh, is uh, uh, the, the theorist who created what later was coined by John Stuart Mill, utilitarianism. Uh, the idea, <coughs> uh, the central idea of Bentham's work is um, that uh, we are all of us seeking pleasure and try to avoid pain. That's what explains human behavior. Utility is this is what we want to avoid. And the correct action is to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. Uh, now, uh, 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 Mill uh, had a nervous breakdown in 1926. He found uh, a Bentham theory too oppressive. Um, uh, he met also Mrs. Harriet Friedman, who was married at that time, and had an interesting triangle, uh, Mr. Taylor and Mrs. Taylor and, and Mill, until Mr. Taylor died, and that's when they actually got married. Um, Harriet Taylor was quite a feminist and had a big impact uh, on the thinking of John Stuart Mill. Harriet died, unfortunately, very early, um, uh, um, and Mill uh, uh, later on uh, wrote his most important book after Harriet's death, but probably greatly influenced by Harriet Taylor. 
are his work. He established a utilitarian society, but eventually became a revisionist um, um, <coughs> because, uh, uh, I will explain it uh, in a minute, because he said there are really higher values which are also utilities, rather than just uh, seeking pleasures. Um, uh, he wrote uh, 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 on liberty, <coughs> on utilitarianism, and finally on the subjection of women. Um, uh, the most important work is probably his work on subjection of women, uh, <coughs> which is uh, 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 inspired many feminists even up to this day. Uh, 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 he argued that women are actually worse uh, in their conditions than slaves because uh, uh, men <coughs> expect women even love rather than just obedience. At least from slaves, they don't expect love. That's the bottom line. Then Karl Marx, well, uh, was born in 1818, uh, studied uh, Bonn and Berlin, uh, I probably can rush through of his life, probably better known than others. In 1944, Frederick Engels um, uh, was expelled from France for revolutionary activities. In 1949, he moves to London, uh, became in involved in politics, uh, and uh, then uh, finally died in 1883. Um, his major works are the Paris Manuscripts, you will be reading from, it's a young Marx um, uh, about alienation, the German ideology, the foundations of what is called historical materialism, the Communist Manifesto, a pamphlet, which is, will, you will read from it, some still interesting arguments, and finally the major work, Das Kapital. This is Das Kapital, and I just skipped uh, the rest of uh, uh, and go on to Friedrich Nietzsche because I'm already running out of time. Well, uh, uh, Nietzsche was born 44 um, as a, a son of a Lutheran minister, uh, studied at the University of Bonn, for a while was uh, a professor at Basel, met, uh, became great friends with Richard Wagner, then became bitter enemies later on, and I will explain to you what is the reason of friendship and uh, anonymous, anonymous city builder. He actually got a, a nervous breakdown uh, and the last 10 years of his life he was just out of touch. He was insane. Um, uh, his major work is what we will be discussing was written in 87. It is the genealogy of morals. Um, and uh, again, I will have to skip uh, what uh, his contributions are. He is First, uh, first of the postmodern theorist, he questions right absolute rationality, and the major bottom line is all knowledge is from a certain perspective, including the moral values, uh, cannot be rooted in some universalistic principles. Sigmund Freud is another author we will be dealing with, born in '56 and lived a very, very long life, moved to Vienna, studied medicine. Um, and, of course, discovered psychoanalysis uh, 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 um, and uh, uh, created the Viennese Psychoanalytic Society, still a major movement. 38 left Lon uh, uh, Vienna for London. Uh, uh, his major work is the first one, the studies on hysteria. This is when psychoanalysis is being discovered, the interpretation of deem uh, dreams, in 88, uh, three essays on sexuality, um, and the two papers what we will be reading from Ego and Id and Civilization and Discontent. Um, again, I, I will just skip, right? Uh, I will put this on the internet, a brief uh, summary of uh, Ego and Id and Civilization and Discontent. Uh, just very briefly, Max Weber, um, a German uh, historian, a legal theorist and sociologist, born in Frankfurt, uh, studied at Heidelberg and elsewhere, um, uh, had a, also a nervous breakdown, recovers it from 92, uh, beginning to work on uh, religion, 
and Right Economy and Society, right in 1920. The major work is what you will be reading, The Protestant Ethic, 1903-1904, and sections of his major unfinished work, Economy and Society. Again, I just skip um, and go to our last author, Emil Durkheim, a French social scientist uh, who was born in 58 and as a son of a rabbi, um, but became an atheist later on and re reconverted back to religi religiosity later in life. Uh, was a professor in France. The major works are what you will be reading from The Division of Labor, then The Rules of Sociological Method, his wonderful book, The Suicide, um, and what you will not be reading from for this course is Elementary Form of Religious Life. So that's about the course, and I hope very much I didn't scare you, but made you interested in it. I will put the slides on, on the internet, so you can scheme on it leisurely. <laughs>